Aloha, everybody. Aloha. Look at that. One remote control controls the whole congregation. That's pretty, pretty cool. Well, let's pray as we continue on back into Galatians 3 after our Easter time and Palm Sunday time. Let's see what God will speak to us today. Father, thank you for uh, Bob being with us today and the beauty of worship. Thank you for the beauty of your word as you ch have chosen to record for all history, uh, something that will never change, and that is the truth of your written word. And as we seek to digest it today, may you apply it to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we have been uh, studying in our series of Galatians. We made our way to the third chapter. But as you know, as Paul has written this, he gets into some pretty deep theology but it's understandable, but it takes time to kind of catch up to it and to digest it. And so that's why we don't rush. We go verse by verse. We'll only hit about four verses today, uh, but it, uh, it's challenging. And I recognize that even as I'm studying, you want to make it relevant. The word of God is relevant, but you want to make it something that, that we're getting and, and kind of understanding. Uh, it reminds me of the... Um, old story that Ronald Reagan used to tell. I like to stay relevant, so uh, I keep Ronald Reagan stories. And it was the, the man that was uh, driving down a country road and uh, he looks out his driver's side window and there's a chicken keeping pace with him. And he's going about 20 miles an hour and all of a sudden the chicken passes him and the chicken's running about 60 miles an hour. So he speeds up and the chicken cuts down an old dirt road and there's a farm there and uh, a farmer out in front, and he says to the farmer, did you happen to see a chicken run through here? He goes, yeah. And he said, uh, it seemed to me like he had three legs. And the farmer said, yeah. He goes, uh, I breed them. He goes, you breed three-legged chickens? And he goes, what's the story with that? And he goes, well, through the years, uh, when we had a chicken dinner, I always liked a drumstick. And uh, Ma always liked a drumstick. And then uh, we had a son and he liked a drumstick. So I started breeding three-legged chickens. And he said, well, how do they taste? He goes, I don't know. I've never been able to catch one. <laughs> That's kind of how it is with our theology. If you miss a few weeks, it's a little hard to catch and catch up to. But we'll, uh, we'll do it and we'll leave the Ronald Reagan uh, jokes behind. I'm going to actually take us back to chapter 3, verse 1. Let's read the first five verses. I'm gonna read out of the New American Standard Version for the first five verses that we studied. You can find this on our YouTube channel. But just to give the context, Paul is criticizing the Galatians because they have allowed people, Jewish Christians, to come in and say, yes, Jesus is wonderful, but you also need to follow the law. Yes, Jesus is wonderful, but you also need to eat kosher. Yes, Jesus is wonderful, but you also need to be circumcised. So Paul comes with this stinging letter and he says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Deceived you is the idea. Who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? They had seen that, they had known that story. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. And Paul continues with his rebuke. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Did, did the Holy Spirit come upon you because of the works that you did? And this is his whole counter to people who are saying Jesus plus something. Or did you do it by the hearing with faith? Verse three, are you so foolish having begun by the spirit are you now being perfected by the flesh? That's a stinging challenge, isn't it? But the reality is a lot of us fall into that trap too. Thank you for saving me, God. Now I need to live out my life and do a bunch of works in order to really be complete. So he challenges them on that teaching that had crept in and says, are you that foolish? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, so then verse five, he says, this is where we left off a couple of weeks ago. So then does he who provide you with the spirit and works miracles among you, does he do that with works of the law or by the hearing with faith? And Paul has been driving home this thought 
that you can't add anything to your salvation, only what Jesus has done on the cross. It's the mercy and grace of God that saves us. And to think that we could score a certain amount of points or to be the good enough people to be acceptable to God counters the work on the cross and doesn't make it uh, viable in the big picture as people view it so often. So we're going to pick up with just four verses today, and that is in verse 6, as Paul is right in the middle of that context, continuing, and he brings in the big boy now to drive home his point as he talks about Abraham. Remember, these were Jewish Christians that uh, felt that they needed to continue on with the law, so Paul reminds them of someone and he says, okay, we can talk about that. How about this? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It doesn't say just as Abraham did the works, Abraham existed before the law was even established. So it wasn't just as Abraham did all these works and that's what made him righteous or in good standing with God. But he says instead, just as Abraham believed God, his belief in God, uh, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, I just said believed in God. It doesn't say that. It says believed God. A lot of people you can ask today and say, hey, do you believe in God? And many will not, non-believers will say, yeah, I believe there's a God or I believe in God. But to believe God is to put your trust in God. To believe that God exists and to believe God has provided the way of salvation is what he's talking about here. And so Abraham that had this unique scripture itself has this unique way of foreshadowing what would happen on the cross by Abraham's faith. It's not all the things that Abraham did. It was his belief about God. It, Abraham believed God and that was reckoned to him or accounted to him for righteousness. Keep in mind, when we use the word righteousness, if you say, is that a righteous person? The, the uh, idea is that they are in right standing with God. So it's not, uh, we used to use the word in the 70s a lot, righteous, everything is righteous. Uh, that doesn't get you very far with God. To be righteous biblically is to be in right standing with God, meaning I trust God, I believe God. I received the gift of salvation from Jesus Christ. And I understand this, nothing that I do of myself, but the free gift that God gave me. That's how we're saved. And this is what Paul is driving home. So because it's a little bit of a Jewish problem, he goes back to Abraham, Father Abraham, who had how many sons? Many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. He, he's the founder of so many. He goes, Father Abraham believed God and that was accounted to him as righteousness. He was in right standing. Verse seven, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So what he does there is really brilliant because father Abraham, many sons, he's the founder of so many religions came out of him, but the, the father Abraham figure that Paul points to is made righteous and therefore, no, he says, only those who are of faith, like Abraham, are sons of Abraham. You can't work for it. You can't just claim your bloodline. So the true sons of Abraham are not just Jews, Paul says. They're Christians, they're Gentiles, they're anyone that has put their faith in God the way Abraham put his faith in God. So those who are of faith, is the term that he uses. It's interesting, I find myself, and I don't know when this developed, but a lot of times when I'm having conversations, many many times a stranger, when I'm flying somewhere or, or have an opportunity to talk to someone, instead of saying, um, do you believe in God or are you a Christian? Um, I've, I found recently I've been saying, are, are you of faith? Or do you have a faith? Now. That alone has to be defined because people have a lot of faith in a lot of different things. But it's a biblical term too, of faith. When we use the term, we define it as a faith in Jesus Christ. I've been born again. It's nothing I've done, it's all of him, but it's a faith. That's basically what Paul's doing here. He's saying, look at Abraham. That's a good person to point to. He had all of his 
belief in God reckoned to him as righteousness. And only those who are of faith, like Abraham, can be called sons of Abraham. And so then he continues and says, and the scripture, there it is, foreseeing or foreshadowing, that God would justify the Gentiles by works, by faith. Jews, by faith. Abraham can't get you there. Moses can't get you there. The law can't get you there. Kosher food can't get you there. But it's justified by faith. Scripture foresaw that, that God would justify the Gentiles by faith as they trusted Christ and preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you, all the nations shall be blessed. How? Because of your faith, Abraham. So Paul, in his debate, or not really a debate, he's writing a letter, but in his argument to say, let's, let's talk Jewish background. How about we go with Abraham? And Abraham himself, Father Abraham, was not justified by his works. He was justified, and it was all accounted to him because of his faith to a right standing with God. So if we were to break it down if I could continue back with individual conversations I have, or perhaps you have. And I ask someone, are they of faith? Or do they have a faith? Um, you'll usually hear their story, but I'm more surprised that I hear yes more than I hear no. They go, well, and then they try and give you their own belief system, which the world is always tainting. And that's what was happening here. The Jewish people are coming in and tainting, you know, the Christian experience. But as they talk about it, and you, if you're patient and you have the time to talk with someone about it, you can explore that. And typically it'll come back to somebody's works. It usually goes like this, you know, are you of faith? Yeah, and they go, what do you think about God? Or what do you think about the Bible? I don't usually go with church. Um, you know, when, when we invite people to the church here, we. We say, like Bob was saying, people, some churches, they swing from the chandeliers. We swing from a disco ball. It's a little different, but we have a different kind of, but I invite them to the coach house, you know, that, but that's not my main emphasis. I love when people visit our church, but my concern is their relationship with Christ. And the more you talk and you say of faith and they will usually say, well, I'm a, you know, this next line, I'm a pretty good person. And that all stems back to works. I said, oh, really, how, how so? Explain that to me. Well, you know, when I was eight, I found a dog and returned it to its owner. And then they'll give you a series of different, you know, things. And uh, years ago, I was having a conversation with um, uh, a uh, individual who was uh, gay and wanted to know, and found out I was a pastor and wanted to talk about that a little bit. He was kind of checking things out. And, uh, and so he said, what does the Bible say? So well, the Bible's pretty clear about it. And I said, but do you want to talk about your sin or do you want to talk about my sin? Because that's only one of the sins that are mentioned. There's a whole list of sins. And I'm not in so much into debating with people if it's right or wrong, I'll tell you what the Bible says. But if you really want to talk about how to resolve the issue, then the issue becomes not if you can be a good enough person and still do these things but what Jesus did for you. Uh, it's not if you could work back up a ladder, but it's what Jesus did you. So are you of faith? Um, how are you, one of my next questions is, how are you in your standing with God? I ask that at deathbeds quite often. Matter of fact, that's more of an urgent question for me. Or someone says, Pastor, will you come and pray with my father or my mother who's passing away? I'll say, are they of faith? And if I get to talk to the person, I will say, are you in good standing with God? Are you okay? Is you're facing death? Some will say, well, I think so. Some will say, I don't know. The ones that clearly know say, yeah, I received Christ as my savior. And that puts me at peace. But if not, you get to explain the plan of salvation. So it doesn't matter the issue or the sin or all these things that sidetrack us. They're all important. They're in the Bible. We study them. But the issue is, what are we going to do with it? If we are of faith, we don't want anything tainting that. And saying, that's good that you believe in Jesus, but you also need to do this. How many cults through the years have started on good Christian doctrine, in theory, and then someone says, yeah, but you also need to do this. And you also need to do this. And you need to only come to our church. 
and you only need to read our magazine, and you know only need to drink our Kool-Aid. And it goes all the way down to even tragedies of 30 years ago. So are you of faith? Paul says the scriptures foreshadowed that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all nations shall be blessed. In this wonderful example of faith, all the nations will be blessed. And the final verse in verse nine says, so then those who are of faith, there it is again. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham, the belief of Abraham. We, we look to Abraham and say, really, that's it? Even back then, all these years before the law was established, all these years ago, the faith of Abraham stands as a testimony to how we are to live. So if this is so important that Paul is taking, how many weeks have we studied this now? Taking all this time to say, don't let anyone add anything to your faith in the sense of additional responsibility. Jesus did it all, trust him alone. If that is so important, if it's really boiling down to this example of Abraham and our example of being people of faith, then we are certainly required not to do works, but to certainly help grow our faith. And there are ways that we can do that. I'm gonna close our time here by looking at three or four ways to help grow our faith that are pretty common sense, but remember they're not works. These are just, I come to this conclusion, if it's all about my faith and me being of faith, I better make sure my faith is pretty strong. Understand that Jesus says it only takes a mustard seed of faith. And sometimes when we're honest with each other, say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I don't feel like I have enough faith for this situation. I say, absolutely. But you've got some. You trust Jesus. Let's see what Jesus says. Let's start with that mustard seed. Let's start with that part. But let's grow it. So I'm going to leave you with three or four ways to help grow your faith uh, as we continue to desire to be closer to Christ. The first one is what you're doing right now is just to hear the word of God. Uh, that, you know, Romans 10 tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So church is one thing. It's a good discipline. It's a good fellowship. It's a joy for those of us who call this our church home. But as you're doing this, you're hearing me teach every week from the word of God. If I start straying from the word of God, you have a biblical responsibility to confront me. If I start bringing in some other kind of false teaching, you have a, a biblical responsibility to confront me. But as we teach and preach the word of God, or you find good teachings where you can hear the word of God even throughout the week, and there are some wonderful resources, that is an excellent way to grow as a Christian and to continue to build upon what we study on Sunday mornings, um, to hear and just to hear and let it uh, kind of come through the ears into your soul and to say, I heard God speak today. And as Romans says, that's the way faith comes to many people just by hearing the word of God and um, believing it as a result. The second way to help grow in your faith, of course, is to read and meditate on God's word. I've heard it. Now I'm gonna maybe go later today uh, or I'll go to a YouTube channel and hear it again. By the way, if you ever need a good way to take a nap on Sunday afternoon, just play my sermon again on YouTube channel. I find that puts me to sleep so smoothly and easily if I'm struggling, but we've got all our sermons there, but you can hear it again, but you can also read these, these verses beyond what you're doing now in your Bibles. Read and then meditate on it. The idea is soaking it in. So number one, I'm hearing the word of God. Then go back and I read it, or you have a daily devotion of reading it, and meditating on it, meditating on it. Everything uh, in the word of God is worth meditating on it. Joshua 1, 8 familiar passage says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it both day and night that you may be able to observe and do according to all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous and then you will have good success by meditating on the word of God. Meditating says, I'm just going to focus here. I'm going to tune out the distractions of all that wants to interrupt me from reading the word of God. I don't watch a lot of TV or a lot of 
TV news, but I noticed uh, on the remote control, um, I think this was uh, Thursday or Friday, uh, and the Dodgers and the Angels were playing two separate games at the same time. And I found that little button, I, I've seen them before, but that's the return button. So I set it up and I was watching the Dodgers and then every time they would pitch, I click that button, boom, go right back to the Angels because Shohei Otani was up to bat. You know, I, I love watching him. So it's Showtime on one channel with Shohei Otani, and the Dodgers had the bases loaded on the other. I'm not a big sports guy, but I look like a picking idiot with that remote. I'm going, you're distracted by the smart. No one else was there, thankfully. And I just kept pushing the remote. And I was bouncing back for an hour at, at uh, both, both games which was a, a lot of fun. There, there's a lot of things we can do with our time, a lot of distractions, but then to say, Mark, do, do you take that hour uh, to meditate on God's word and just keep hitting the, hitting the return button back to Joshua 1 or whatever passage, you would do real well. So hear God's word. Number two, read and meditate on God's word. The third one, and we've done it here today, but it's more of a private time, and that is to spend time with God. Spend time with God. We're told in Mark 1 that Jesus would go into a secluded, out from the house into a secluded place. To spend time with God really means you need to be alone with God. And I hope you have a place like that. Um, maybe it's a walk on the beach. Maybe it's a prayer closet, as we often say. That doesn't have to be a physical closet. Um, but it's a place where you just say, this is where I spend time with God. I found a, a red chair that I sit in, a very comfortable chair, and I just sit. Sometimes I read my Bible, but I just sit. And I, I'm not listening for an audio uh, voice from God, but I just sit and hear from him and meditate and spend time with God. Sometimes I'll say, is there anything you want to point out in my life? Um, and I'll just sense the spirit of God saying, let's work on this. Or sometimes it's just, I love you. You know, that, that security you get from your relationship with God. But the idea is we move so fast that spending time with God can be challenging. Find a place, find a time. Jesus did it, it says in this passage in Mark 135, he did it early in the morning. Sometimes that's a good time for people, a good place for people. Um, but it could be late at night. It could be any time at all. And finally, a good way to help grow your faith is to exercise your faith. We, that's application. We hear God's word. We study and meditate on it. We spend time alone with God. But we have to put it into practice in some way. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Just to grow our faith, James says it this way in James 1, through 24, be doers of the word and not only hearers, because that deceives you. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a mirror for simply observes himself for a moment. He walks away and forgets what he looks like. Now we can do a Sunday morning experience and hopefully it's encouraging for you today. We can glance at God's word. And yet if we decide to study it, meditate on it, and spend time with God, we need to do something with that. So that's sharing your faith or praying with someone or having a little dialogue. Never be afraid to have dialogue. There are so many hurting and lonely people in this world that would love for you just to say, hey, and that will start a conversation. And I try and exercise that both with my personality, but with my faith to just interact with people. And I find more and more that, especially in this day and age, it doesn't take but a moment for it to go spiritual. Bob's big boy up in Burbank for the last 35 years does a car show every Friday night. It's just a bunch of old guys, basically. <laughs> and they, they bring their beautiful cars and this guy has a beautiful uh, 57 Chevy convertible, beautiful car. He said he bought it nine years ago for $80,000 and he could sell it right now for 120,000. So I whipped out the cash and I gave it to him. <laughs> but in, in, in a, maybe a three minute conversation, I need to be careful because I'm recording this. Uh, things went spiritual, 
but it went dark and I ended up just kind of walking away. It wasn't appropriate to go further than that. But it, it went to freedoms and blessings to, if anybody does this, I'll do this. And, and I thought, oh, and it wasn't appropriate for me to, in that context, to go any further. But I thought to myself, there's so many people hungry for conversation. There are so many people in need. And sometimes we just plant seeds, right? Sometimes we just say, hey, I'll pray with you over that or I'll pray for you about that. I didn't tell him I was gonna pray for him, but I did <laughs> when I left. There's a lot of people in need and we get to exercise our faith. You don't have to preach a message. Sometimes it's an invite, sometimes it's a pamphlet, sometimes it's just being kind and extending the gift of Christ. But we need to exercise our faith. So there, there they are, hear the word, read and meditate on the word, spend time with God and exercise your faith. I'm gonna ask Bob to close us out in the final song today. And as we sing with him here, this nice doxology, let's go strong today, but let's go with the challenge of putting into practice what we study daily and certainly as we gather together midweek and on Sunday mornings. Father, thank you for the gift. Thank you for the joy. Thank you for your church. May we not just soak it in but may we, like a sponge, wring it out on other people who are so hungry and in need of what we know. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for that teaching. I, I, I have to be reminded, you know, that... The, the mistake of thinking that you you know got started out in the spirit and then we're going to finish this thing in the flesh. Yes, oh my! Um, my inner scam artist is always at work <laughs> trying to figure out a way around <laughs> things. <clears throat> so it's good to hear that teaching and be reminded that I'm not alone. <laughs> um, this is uh, you will of course recognize the last verse and I hope that you will sing with me. Um, the doxology that we sing is actually to an old hymn tune called Old 100 or Old 100th. And there's lots of text to that uh, um, tune. And so just for fun, I cherry pick some verses out to sort of make like a super doxology. So, so that's what we're going to end with today. So I'll bless you with the first uh, two or three verses. And then we'll join together uh, as a congregation at the end. You faithful servants of the Lord, sing out His praise with one accord, while serving Him with all your mind, and keeping
good Sunday. God bless you.